Good evening, everyone. I'm Katie Stover, Director of Reader Services for the Kansas City Public Library. Thank you for joining us this evening to hear Tim Fielder talk about one of the most exciting, beautiful, and thought-provoking graphic novels you'll read this year, Infinitum, an Afrofuturist tale. Every once in a while, and far less these days, but still, I hear from a reader who says, I don't like graphic novels. And I'm told it's the blending of pictures and texts that is confusing or distracting for these readers. I think of graphic novels as reading material that demands the very best of your attention and imagination. There are panels that present roller coaster action. You can hear the crowd noise, the machines whirring, or the wind howling. And there are panels of quiet, intense beauty where you can hear the crickets or the light ocean waves. Graphic novel artists can impart a character's anguish or joy with a simple pen stroke. And you'll see all of this and far more in Infinitum along with a layered story any book club would have a field day discussing. For Infinitum, as you suspected, is about time. There is a West African proverb, time lost is lost forever. Tim Fielder has taken that proverb and given it a little twist. He asks, what is time gained? This unique book is a bold story of survival. It celebrates the presence of the black man and black woman in genre storytelling and moves from the beginning of time until the end of the universe. And if my introduction is all you needed to start reading Infinitum, Tim and I hope you order it from bookshop.org or your favorite independent bookstore. And if you use bookshop.org, then you know that bookshop.org supports local independent bookstores with every purchase. Tim Fielder is an OG Afrofuturist with a dedication to visual Afrofuturism. All of his work, stories and art, feature black characters in speculative or science fiction. His visual art appears as illustrations, cartoons, animations, storyboards, films, games, comics, and more. He has worked with TriStar Pictures and Marvel. Tim has taught at New York University, the School of Visual Arts, the New York Film Academy, and Howard University. Along the way, he found some time to win a Glyph Award. Recently, his work was showcased in a career retrospective exhibition at the Hammonds House Museum. And if I understand correctly, Tim is in the process of turning that retrospective into a memoir. Tim is the founder of Diesel Funk Studios and a co-inventor of the art form glogging with his twin brother, Jim. And if you don't know what that is, ask Tim in the chat. And if you don't, I will. Please welcome Tim Fielder, author of Infinitum, an Afrofuturist tale. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was the single most awesome introduction. I want to meet this guy. <laughs> this guy is, he just sounds incredible. Thank you so much. Wow. I am, I, you know, uh, hopefully the red behind me there will, will not allow the blushing that I have going on in my complexion to show up. But thank you so much. Wow. That's, that was awesome. <laughs> So Tim, tell us about Infinitum and how it embodies your ideas of visual Afrofuturism. Yeah, so Infinitum is a story that I came up with in early 2000s. Uh, and I have my, my, my brother, Boston, who is my, my agent and rep uh, with Fiscal Media. We, we were walking towards Magic Johnson's theaters in Harlem. And we were going to see a movie and I told him the story about this black man who could not die. The idea was that I grew up in a situation, I'm an African-American male from Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, and one of the most alarming things I've ever seen was Sunday at the church, if that could be believed, during midday, Night of the Living Dead by George Romero was on. And if anyone has seen uh, Night of the Living Dead, spoiler alert, at the end, the black guy who is the most intelligent person and the one with the most agency in the entire film gets away from the zombies, but just as he's about to get away, he is shot by these zombies. So he doesn't get away. And this is the type of thing that many people in my generation have seen over and over and over and over again in popular media, particularly in film media. Uh, and I wanted to do a story where the brother would live. 
<laughs> he would live. He would live to be able to see the next day. However, I didn't want the story to be one dimensional. I wanted it to be multi dimensional. I wanted a character who was far. Uh, you've seen this talk lately about black pain. Well, I'm here to tell you black pain does exist. So I didn't want to shy away from that. But I'm a, I am a child of George Lucas, uh, Star Wars. I like explosions and spaceships and, and, and you know, uh, all these kinds of, of, uh, uh, of, of intergalactic, you know, but to take that and to put that in my, my story. So that was the, the genesis of Infinitum. Uh, and also I want to do something that looked really good as well. Something that looks super cool. Thank you. <laughs> it is very cool. You brought some images with you of, of yes, it is. or with us. And I'll thank you, Harper Collins. What what is going on in this photo? <laughs> okay, so I'll explain this. I'll explain this because a lot of people ask about this. This is taken by my friend Ed Mark during the show at New York Gallatin Galleries. Uh, this was my career retrospective that ended up at Hammond's house. Uh, museum and uh this shot i told i said ed man i want to do a shot like spike man he was like what so he laid on the floor uh and i jumped over him needless to say that was the last jump i did i, I hurt myself immediately afterwards but it's a great looking shot <laughs> it has all of my artwork behind it as well and are you really turning that into a memoir of sorts Yes, I am. Black Metropolis, which was initially a story that I had written uh, about the Yorba Arisha in a high-tech environment, similar to Ridley Scott, you know, Sid Me, Blade Runner, that type of thing. And I wanted to do Yorba Arisha in that environment. But, you know, the, the, the climate, the publishing world uh, wasn't ready at that time. And frankly, neither was I. I was a young man. I was 20. Uh, I'm in my 50s now wanted to do something that would that would have some kind of heart to it, but have a sheen to it, if that makes sense. Like the great concept designers like Ralph McQuarrie and all of that. But as a result of me doing that, I have all of this work that hasn't been seen, like 35 years worth of work. And we, as you can just see on the wall, the image here, I literally have analog work. This right here didn't even in that shot, didn't even feature the digital work. I would imagine I have thousands of pieces at this point that I want to show in Black Metropolis, which will be not just my career retrospective, but also talk about all the knuckleheaded stuff I did over the decades. This is a lot of content. And I'm reminded of an interview that you did with Greg Anderson, Elise of Bleeding Cool. And you talked about the public's insatiable appetite for content and how media companies are, are frantic for the creation of content. And this has been a boom for artists and creators, hasn't it? Yeah, it is. In fact, uh, it's so interesting that you would say that. So uh, uh, my wife uh, uh, binge watched this show called Dem on Amazon last night. So if I look a little bleary eyed, it's because I was there with her for a little bit. I couldn't hang tough the whole that time. But Dim is about, you know, uh, you know, this black characters in a kind of horror speculative scenario. And the the world, the content creators, the content makers are understanding that uh, we, the black community, the community of color women, minorities have an interest and we're into speculative fiction, meaning we watch Star Trek and Star Wars too. And we want to watch that stuff and see ourselves represented in that work. And uh, it just so happens, I did not plan it this way. It just so happens that my work uh, is very timely and I'm very happy uh, to do the work and I'm open to, um, well, I'm trying to figure out the most diplomatic way to say this. I have had so many opportunities coming at me and I don't want to be like a kid in a candy store, you know, where you eat everything. I want to be discriminating about, you know, cause I could gorge myself on everything, but I don't want to. So I'm just trying to be very smart, very professional 
and, and on point. So yes, it's amazing time to be alive. And uh, speaking of time, where you are, it's a little, uh, how's the storm in New Orleans right now? Ironically enough, it has now stopped storming, it appears. But because oh. I'm talking about it, it may start back. So let me not speak to that much more. <laughs> yeah. uh, folks, if you're wondering, that'll explain some of the stutter in our internet feed. We're, we're hoping that New Orleans doesn't get hit with another massive tropical storm. So uh, Tim, would you talk a little bit about visual futurism and how you, how, why that term? Because you've talked about how visual futurism, Afro Afrofuturism is different from the written Afrofuturism that we see. Right, right, uh, excellent question. So Afrofuturism, for those who, who don't know, uh, uh, it, Afrofuturism is the intersection of black uh, race politics, technology, speculative scenarios, uh, and the drama and the collision that creates a product. And that product, even more so than I originally thought, because for me, it was always just black science fiction. You know, hey, I want to do Star Trek with black characters. I want to do, you know, uh, Star Wars with black characters. I want to talk about the, the black experience within that. But I found out that Afrofuturism can extend farther, can extend to fashion, it can extend to politics. Uh, there are those who say that uh, Martin Luther King was an Afrofuturist because he saw the mountaintop, even though he didn't get there, but he could visualize it. That's Afrofuturism. Uh, it can be in a housing law. It can be in, of course, prose with writers like Samuel R. Delaney, N.K. Jemison, who was just uh, nominated for a Hugo Award, uh, and my friend John Jennings. Uh, all these people are speculative creators within the um, within that space. And uh, I guess I'm a, a visual Afrofuturist, and a visual Afrofuturist is a person who takes that material but applies it to a visual narrative, right? Now, there are visual Afrofuturists um, so I would say like Overton Lloyd, who did the Parliament Funkadelic album covers, or Pedro Bell, mm -hmm. those are visual Afrofuturists, but primarily, even though they did comics or still do comics, one of the things they did were, were, was still images. My friend Eric Wilkerson, who does um, Kwame Mbalia's work, uh, Tristan Strong series, he's a visual Afrofuturist, but he works primarily in still images. I am a visual Afrofuturist, but I work in sequential art, otherwise known as comics or graphic novels. And that is what I do. Uh, I have been doing it since I was 12, 13 years old. Back then I had a lot of hair, now I don't. So I've been doing it for an incredibly long time. That's a nice segue into looking at some of the images that you brought with you from Infinitum. So we, well, we've done that and woo. Infinite and preview. Oh. Infinite preview. Here oh, we go. Oh yeah. This this image just leapt right off the page the very first time I saw it in the book. And that's why I think, wow, I kind of want to see this in a movie, but we'll talk about that later. So talk about this image now. Right. I'll make this uh you know, it's interesting because DMX, the uh the rapper, just uh passed away. And one of the things that DMX was known for was always being photographed with these pit bulls. And pit, ball, pit bulls uh, have a reputation for not being very nice animals, right? Pit bulls and rottweilers. But they, could, they obviously could be very sweet dogs. Uh, uh, there's that saying that goes, it's, it's the owner that determines the mentality of the pet, you know, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in this particular portion of the story at the beginning, I wanted to demonstrate that this character uh, was almost um, stereotypically hyper-masculine at this particular point in the story. Because the character goes through an arc where, you know, by the end, he is absolutely not that. But I wanted to do this and use a lot of iconography. Uh, he establishes he is a warlord. Mm -hmm. uh, it establishes uh, that he is at war with other societies. Uh, the, all the way from the Kush to the Egyptians, uh, uh, using his fictional Black kingdom at war against real Black kingdoms to establish a historical 
um, on their on their uh, line or through line to establish the character, and that's part of the world builder. Also, the dogs uh, go back to what I was saying about DMX. Is that it's the idea of using the best writers and the best artists take things that are familiar and they embed them in the work to grab the audience. And I said, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the dogs really large. So they ride them like horses. But then I had to take it a step farther and render it realistically. So, hey, I'm a fantasy artist. I love people like Frank Frazetta. I'm sorry. That's how I grew up. Conan the Barbarian. That got, you know, and one of my favorite artists, Tim Conrad, who, who adapted uh, Robert E. Howard's Almerick. And I wanted to pay homage to those artists even to the way he has his arms outspread like a Frazetta painting, but put it within this Afrocentric context. This is just, I see all of that now, and I don't think I saw that the first time I looked at this image, because all I could, all I, that caught my eye was the movement in the image and the, and the carnage. And in the upper right corner, that actually looks like a hand holding that one person. <laughs> Yes, yes. It's, I wanted to show chaos. I come from a family of filmmakers. So a large part of what I was doing was, okay, you, 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 you're going to make me say it. This infinitum is a storyboard, okay? It functions <laughs> as a graphic novel, a storyboard, and a picture book. It is a hybrid book of all those things together. And when you saw it, I mean, I want you to see, I want you to see the baddest movie possible. I want you to see, whoa, man, there's these huge dogs. And they're riding on these dogs with these weapons like from Game of Thrones. That's what I wanted to do. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> I said, I want to see it bigger. So yes. let's look at another image. What's the let's take a look at the next one. Oh, oh, this character just broke my heart. Tell us about her. Okay, without giving too much of the story away, um, uh, I would say that uh, Aja Oba, who was the main character riding a dog, uh, and his wife cannot bear children. They are the king and queen of this kingdom, uh, both equal in power and in influence, yet they cannot bear children. And, you know, uh, uh, feudal societies operate on royal systems. They need offspring. Uh, and uh, the main character is, as I say, dealing with at that particular point in the story, a hyper male, so he has a concubine. However, this concubine is not a wolf. She is a sorceress. And he does the wrong thing, which I will not go into what that is. And as a result, he is cursed with the gift of immortality, forced to live from one age to the next, seeing all those who he, he, he loves, Societies come up and wither to dust for all eternity. She struck me as the most powerful character in Infinitum. Her presence is everywhere. Her presence permeates through all of the narrative. She, you know, I, I can't talk about too much. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I know we're going to have to talk a little bit off screen. It's like, yeah, so why did that happen? And, okay, I can talk about it now. But uh, I would say that it's so important to me that characters have purpose. And, and a lot of that came through the original Marin Dandy, the, you know, when it, we first submitted it to Harper. That time was about 230 pages. But at the end, it came out to 280 pages because through the editorial process, we had to add pages, we had to change dialogue, modify things. We needed to give more of a voice to the secondary characters, which you know was painful to do because who wants to paint 50 extra pages? But if it makes the book better, then you paint the 50 extra pages and you put the work in. And so that's what was important about this character because uh, or any character, but particularly this character, because she is the catalyst. She is the catalyst. She, her presence needs to be felt. So let's like, take a look at the next image. Um, and and the, as we go through these images, we're going to see, we're going to see Aja Oba mm -hmm. start moving through time. Yes. How his, now his name is John. Yes. 
This uh, is, is it me or am I supposed to see um, Blade Runner? Yes, you are. Okay. You are. <laughs> uh, 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 yes, you are. Uh, it was something I was uh, listening to a documentary with uh, Stanley Kubrick the other day, and they were talking about the end part of the movie where David Bowman goes through the light tunnel and he's oh, doing the whole eye thing and his lights and stuff everywhere. And uh, they said, well, what happened? What was that? What was happening? And he said that he would never tell anyone what happened because sometimes you don't want to answer every question. You want the audience to make up their mind. So on one end, I want you to see Blade Runner for three reasons. One, I love Sid Mead. Sid Mead passed away in 2019. He was the primary concept designer for Blade Runner. He did Blade Runner, did Aliens, he designed Tron. I mean, he's just an incredible graphic designer, incredible concept designer. Uh, so I wanted to pay homage to the works of Sid Mead and Ridley Scott. Also, you never see any black characters in those type of scenarios. So I said, I'm going to do this image. And believe it or not, this is one of the first images I did. I finished. So this image was finished in 2018. So I wanted to, to do an image that would show a person who looks like me, like my sons, like my father, like my brothers, in a futuristic scenario where we actually still exist. Also, in this image, there are some of my colleagues, my friends, uh, Jason Reeves, his 133 art. His, he's, a, he's one of the people that helped me print my book that got me the infinitum deal. So I wanted to pay homage. So what I'm doing, whatever I'm doing an image, I'm doing what's called, uh, I've, I've used this term before, I call it um, embedded detail. And embedded detail or implied detail Implied detail is where you put detail in it that an image, an audience may not get all of it, but they will know that something is there. And that is how I work. I have to work in an iterative way because, you know, it hurts to do images like this so detailed, uh, straight as I'm doing them uh, digitally. So I have to make sure that I'll spend a few hours, I'll take a break, I'll come back to it. But as I do it, I can add more and more and more detail. So many of these images in Infinitum, so many of these illustrations, um, they're worthy of framing. And are there any images that broke your heart to leave out, but they had to go in service to the story? Oh, wow. That's, do you know you're the first person to ever ask me that? Thank you. Oh, wow. There was this one image that I had done uh, where, it's it's where Oba is finally uh, at that time is aware that oh my God I'm immortal and I'm outliving all these people around me, and the image that you see is actually a photograph untouched, right? But I chose that image because I had done the same image. The character was saying he was painted, but the background was fully painted in these red and blues, and I always loved that image. But it had to go because that background was taken in a photo when my wife, my cousin Tana, and I were driving from Atlanta to New Orleans, and we got stuck in a three hour long, and the sky opened up and it was so beautiful. And I said, I had to take a photo of it. And as soon as I took the photo, I was playing around one day and stuck that behind that character. You ever done something like if you're moving furniture around and it you make a mistake and it goes, Poop, it tells you immediately, this is where we belong. That's what it was. Yes. We would love to see that. We would love to see that. So what's happening in this, this image? Has Oba realized that he's, by this point, he's been cursed? Yeah, he is going, exactly. Exactly. He is going to, to, to take his child. Uh, but in this particular case, I will say from two different ways. Uh, you know, not everything has to be these broad, sweeping strokes like I've done. And some of the images, you know, you have the massive battles, with, you know, 500 characters in there. Sometimes you want to move the camera in close and you want to be able to feel the emotion. Also, I'm a huge fan of uh, David Lean, 
you know, David Lee, Lawrence of Arabia, you know, uh, uh, what's the one uh, with uh, Omar Sharif in it, um, uh, uh, Dr. Shivago. I love those sprawling pieces. So you see the character, but then you see the landscape behind it. And that was also, I'm a, I'm a child of the film industry. So I wanted to show a black character riding these massive dogs, but this time do it in a darker environment, but let that moonlight show through. I'm so big on using light in my images because light tells the story. The lack of light also tells the story. This, this image right here is also a marvelous blend of your, your love for a cinematic landscape and, and your portraiture because I see that in all the faces in Infinitum. Which features of the human face do you find most difficult or most rewarding to create? You are the first person to ever ask me that question. Thank you. Oh, she did her research. Thank you so much. Well, I'm like, I don't know what to say. Uh, so I've been doing portraiture for, uh, we're supposed to be talking about Infinitum. I've been doing portraiture now for about, since like 20, 2006 is when I did my first digital portrait. And since that time, I've drawn probably ooh, 600, 500 to 600 portraits in the computer. I use a digital pad or sometimes I'll use a big Wacom tablet. And as I've drawn people from all walks of life, all ethnicities, all genders, uh, it's allowed me to record in my brain how faces are formed and shaped. And as a result of that, I'm able to hopefully, the intent is to embed that emotion that I pull from my subjects and put them into my characters. And these, your faces, the faces of your characters are so alive. They're the first thing we see when we see these images. Oh, this is neat. Yeah, if you could go back to the image before, uh, I think it's important to show this uh, because, you know, and this is for for the, the younger cartoonists, the younger uh, painters out there. Uh, I want, I, I specifically put this in the slideshow and I'll, I'll be very brief with it. Um, it all starts with a sketch, baby. Every time it starts with a sketch. There's no escape from the work. You still have to do your studies. You still have to play around with your shapes and your forms. Um, and in this particular case, I wanted to do to show that images start as sketches and they over time have more and more detail and things are put in and things are taken away. And you keep doing it until you have an image that evokes the proper narrative emotion. But it always starts with a sketch. I can start to see the intensity in the the anger in the sketch right here. And then, yes. and then it really, this is the embodiment of in your face. <laughs> yeah, wow, I've never heard it put that way, but yes, it's, it's because, uh, let's be frank, you're, you're a, a librarian, your job is to communicate with the audience, right? Mm -hmm. So we both essentially have the same job. Uh, you're trying to capture the imagination of the audience. And the way you do that is you verbalize, you showcase, you can pick certain books and you can use the cover to entice a reader. So that's what I had to do. I just had to do it 280 times. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what other images you brought with you. Ah, uh, yes, I, I have uh, the, uh, uh, this, I, I decided to put in an image of the book. Here it is here. Uh, I want to say this is weird. I was having this conversation the other day. Uh, a person like, yeah, it's so weird. And what does it feel like? I said, well, it feels real when the book is so heavy, you could give someone a concussion with it, <laughs> right? And so that's how important to me. So if I grab the book here, there it is there. And it's so, it's so meaningful to me and to my parents and to my siblings and my, my sons. This book is dedicated to my boys, Jacob and Max. And uh, to do this book without them. And that's why it was so important that it be a thick book. I like that, you know what I mean? Uh, I wanted to do a book that would uh, have some heft to it. 
this story definitely has heft. There are so many layers to this story. There are so many, it's, it's complex. It's not just a, it, it's not just a time immemorial story. There's so many human relationships that are, that we're talking about. And you folded in lots of other themes as well. Mm-hmm. So this, um, this might be a good time to take some of the audience questions. There we go. I'm going to scoot over real quick and okay. see. What and let me doing. also say, I'm just seeing it. I apologize to the folks out there. Uh, uh, if there's been some stutter, that was not my intention. Uh, oh. uh, as, uh, we're in the middle of a tropical storm in New Orleans. So someone has asked, how long does it take you to create one of your typical images, uh, pages? Um, and mm. thinking of you multiplying that by 280. Yeah, well, I, I have no, not much hair. So there's one a bit of evidence. The other thing is, uh, sometimes it depends on the composition. Obviously, the more characters in a shot, the longer it takes, uh, you know, which sometimes I would be kicking myself. It's like, did you really need to show this shot of this one shot where a or John is walking through the snow and he saved all these folks' lives, but you had to draw all 500 of them, right? But yeah, you're, you know, halfway through, it was like, you didn't need this shot. But the audience knows, the audience appreciates the time and the effort. And when you do it that way, they know that the story means something. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So I would say on an average painting, it always took at least a day and a half. Uh, uh, You know, because a regular comic book is, you know, can be anywhere from three to nine images. My book is one fully painted image per page. Uh, and, uh, Hey, what can I say? It was, uh, it was like lifting a boulder. <laughs> times. It got lifted. It got it lifted. It did. It did. Thank you. You added some, this is, it wouldn't be far off as a librarian who specializes in fiction to even say, this is something of an historical novel. So it's you, you hit the historical genre a little bit and Thank you. well as there's science fiction, it's speculative, it's, you have a, a lovely combination of all these different genres. Oh, there's romance working in there, multiple layers of romance. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. you saw that. Excellent. Oh yeah. <laughs> there's you. this. This book is, um, this book is unique, folks, because it is a graphic novel that is also a romance, historical fiction, speculative fiction, it's all in a graphic novel. This has everything. Uh, I'm going to have to get your permission to use what you just said, but that is awesome. <laughs> you describe everything in the book. And, and I would say this, that's why I made the character immortal. And I'm not unique to this. Uh, uh, For, Forrest Gump, that character lived through time. And the way you do that, the reason why you do that is you have the opportunity to express views on all these different points having a character that interacts with all these different periods benjamin button you remember that movie with uh mm-hmm. david Fink? same thing i just did it with this character this black character but i wanted to pay homage to all of the practitioners of of, of afrofuturism sammy r delaney Octavia Butler, you got the, the younger heads coming up now, which is great. I, I mean, I, I'm coming up, but I'm not as young as I used to be, but I wanted to show that. And by doing that, I needed to deal with past period-based Afrofuturism, but also present day and all way to be on. That's what I wanted to do. That leads us to a really interesting comment that one of the viewers has. Um, The viewer writes, it honestly had not occurred to me that people of color were absent from those futuristic scenes in movies. Um, I guess that's pretty much white privilege defined. And now the viewer is asking, I wonder, have you seen any progress on that front in recent years with the broader push to make movies more representative of the population? Yes, yes. Over the last, 
Well, I'm going to say this. I've never really said it like this. I teach for the New York Film Academy from time to time. I teach storyboarding, concept, character design. And one of the things I would always do with my students, because if you're a teacher, you know, you're a library and I, you know, I'm a teacher. So you have to, it's always about trying to grab a student or a reader and a hit. I have to do. So the way to do that is you have to speak to the truth, right? So yes, we've had decades of black faces not being represented in just standard fair speculative fiction. I mean, and when it would happen, like Nichelle Nichols, who's the original uh, 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 Afrofuturist, uh, it's, it was an event. But since Orange is the New Black for Netflix, then you begin to see things open up. And so now with the streaming series out there, the streaming services, these companies both know the value of content and people of color in our communities are more consolidated. We're now political and financial force. We clearly read and buy books. You know, they gave me money to do my book. I'm sorry, I'm, I gotta go right there, right? And um, it is, how should I say? It is absolutely changing. Uh, Infinitum is the first Afrofuturist graphic novel from a big five company. It's very scary to do that, but I'm also confident because I know I did my best work uh, and I did it for the right, really, really uh, eager to add more stories to, 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 the, to the pot, if you will. I'm, I'm really, really uh, anxious to get to the next things now. I'm I'm equally anxious to see what happens next, especially especially with this book. I, I really kind of want to ask, but the last page, everyone, once you get to it, you'll think, but what happens now? <laughs> spoiler alert, spoiler alert. And, and no, also, no, no, no spoilers. That's just how you'll react. And that's how right. I that's how I want readers to react. You should hold this book and wonder what next and then keep thinking about it the best books stay with you and you keep thinking and you turn to the front cover and you start over or you go to that spot where you were where you stopped to just muse on a segment so this book is going to have people doing that in so many different places Thank so, you so now i want to ask you about um does your brother jim help you with this at all help you with your work at all uh, Jim and I, uh, that's, that's my, that's my, uh, my, my, my road dog, my running buddy. Uh, Jim and I do our thing uh, uh, separately from the graphic novels. He, we have this thing called the Diesel Funk show that we've been working on forever. We're going to get that done soon, but that's more around my portraiture. Uh, with my books, that's something that I do and I've been blessed to work with my brother, Boston. Uh, and he's the movie guy. So a lot of like the last question talking about is their interest yeah we're we're talking to hollywood right now it's so weird you know because prior to this it was just ramen news but now it's like hey we're talking to hollywood great <laughs> you know so it's interesting it is it's going to be fascinating i'm going to have another look really quick and see what else we have here um oh um are non-black audiences warming up to afrofuturism themes in print and screen um what kind of effects have uh, has Black Panther had on that? I know that it uh, Right. E excellent question. The first thing is my book was signed. I was signed to do a book. That was in itself a miracle for me because it's an original storyline. It wasn't an adaptation of, of, another, of a writer's work. It was my story. Uh, so that's the, the first thing that hits me immediately. But beyond that, I mean, Lovecraft Country is a book. That's an adaptation. That's yeah. the series, a, a movie a series. But that story was written by a white writer. Uh, so Afrofuturism, although I would not consider uh, uh, Gene Roddenberry an Afrofuturist, there were Afrofuturist aspects to Star Trek. Uh, there just futurist aspects to Star Trek. I mean, uh, uh, George Takai, you know, Nichelle Nichols, and on and on and on dealing with things like race and gender and, and different social mores. That's, that's part of what the best work does. And the more opportunities you give to people from the, it's overused, but it's true from diverse, varied backgrounds, the more diverse and varied the content that we have access to. 
and the more powerful our community and our society will be because of that. And uh, yeah, that's, that is absolutely the way I feel. I feel very strongly about that. You've been mentioning an awful lot of movies, and this is a movie that got mentioned in the chat. Where do you see Brother from Another Planet fitting in all of this? Yeah, I consider Brother from Another Planet Afrofuturism. Uh, John Sales, you know, a white gentleman, uh, but one of the greatest uh, writers, uh, screenwriters. A lot of people don't notice about John Sales. John Sales is a magnificent screenwriter. And for many movies that you see, he is one of the screenwriters on them. They, he did it for years. Uh, but Brother from Another Planet was this really amazing film that captured not just a moment in New York history. I, I lived in New York uh, since the 80, uh, 86, 86, 87. But it also did it with this actor who brought so much love and depth uh, Joe Morton, who is, is, is like, I call him the, uh, our contemporary Paul Winfield. He's in everything. He's in Top Scandal. He's in Justice League. He's in all these movies because he is such a brilliant actor. And uh, that is, uh, yeah, Brother from Another Planet is an important film. He's wonderful to listen to. I want him to narrate books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we are hopefully going to be starting on the audio book for uh, uh, Infinitum soon, so that is a thought. Oh, yes. Pass that along to the HarperCollins folks that we, we have we have opinions. They listen. Thoughts. They listen. <laughs> <laughs> they listen. Right, right. Um, let, this might be a good time for you to share with the folks, if you can, a special image that might hit home for Kansas City folks. Yeah, I uh, let me share the screen here if I can. Let me share my screen. And I'm going to minimize this just for a second here. I'm gonna share the screen. And I think what we're gonna go for is this one right here. Yes, can you guys see that? Uh, it's, it's going to be coming up. We see a, oh, so. Everyone watching, we're the first ones to see this image. Yes. The image yes. that Tim has made of Kansas City Public Library's iconic parking garage bookshelves. Oh, Tim, that's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to do an image of Virginia. Uh, let me just take a moment to talk about Virginia. This woman has pushed me to do this image for so long. I, and I've told her numerous times, I'm gonna get it in, I'm gonna get it in. And she is so, and all the people with this uh, podcast have just been so encouraging. And I just wanted to make sure I did this image for this group. Uh, and that was important. I actually think, let me see if I can do this last thing here. If I can't do it, then we won't worry about it. But I am now going to export the time lapse. I don't know, can you guys see that? Well, this is a treat. We're watching the artist at work. Yes. So wow. I actually recorded it as a movie and I will be uploading it so you guys can have it and <gasps> use it however you want. It's your decision. You can put it on a website. You can put it anywhere you want. It is absolutely Kansas City. You know, take your thing, do what you got to do with it. All beautiful. This is, this is gorgeous, Tim. I don't know how to thank you for that. Thank you for having me. You guys Wonderful. Are That's just amazing. So any, so, oh, go on. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, please. I was gonna ask if there are any other thoughts you had to share with us about your book, about um, about uh, your other book, the one that we had to move because it was over your shoulder. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's- Maddie. That's, oh yeah, Maddie's Rock, yeah, that's the one. So Maddie's I self-published this guy here oh. back in the day. It's called Maddie's Rock, and it, this book got me infinitum because I had done that book uh, and it's a graphic novel about a, a black woman in a alternative past Jim Crow uh, kind of environment. Think Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, but with the cast of Stormy Weather with the main character as Lena Holmquist. And that is the next book I will be doing as well as Black Metropolis. So I'm so, so happy to be doing that now. 
Tim, this has been a marvelous evening talking with you, sharing your art and that lovely Kansas City image. We're, we're going to treasure that at Kansas City Public Library. No other artist has ever done that for us. Thank you. I, I, it's my honor to do it. And thank you, Virginia, for pushing me. I got it done. <laughs> Virginia is very good at pushing people to do things. She's very good. She's very good at it. <laughs> So everyone, thank you so much for joining us for a conversation with Tim Fielder for Infinitum and Afrofuturist Tale. Please get a copy at your library or your favorite bookstore, independent bookstore, and we'll, <laughs> and we'll see you again at the next event. Good night, everyone.